Okay, let's go and get started today. Uh, today we're going to talk about something that's a little less uh, theoretical uh, and a little more practical, and that is parsing context-free grammars. Now, essentially what parsing is, uh, well, let's start off with what a grammar is. A grammar is a way of defining a language, and that language it's defined is the set of strings of only terminals that can be produced by that grammar. So in other words, if you have uh, start with the start production, you just use valid productions in the grammar until you get some string that's in T star, just terminals, then you have a string that's in that language. And the set of all of those strings that you can get to like that are the uh, language that's defined by the grammar. And sometimes though, we want to know, just like with the DFA, we want to know, is this string in the language that's defined by that thing? And the, in other words, we have a string, we know what the string is, and we want to say, is this in the language? Or how were the rules of the language used to, or the rules of the grammar used to create uh, the string, to generate the string? So that means we can really use grammars in two different ways. One is we can generate strings of the defined language by starting with S, running through uh, various rules of productions until we get only terminals. And then the second way is to act as a recognizer for that string. And when we say a recognizer, we really mean uh, something like in uh, with a DFA where we feed in a string, it tells us yes or it tells us no. So item one, the first one, generating strings, that's relatively straightforward. We just start with S, we apply productions, replacing a variable with the right hand side of the production, replace another variable right hand side of the production. We just keep doing that until we get only variable or only terminals. And then we get only terminals. We have found a string in our language. So we can generate strings uh, in some defined language relatively easily. But item two is a little more difficult because we need to find a derivation uh, for the string. In other words, we need to say, here's a given string. How do I get from S, the start production, to that string. What's the path that was used to get there? What's the derivation look like uh, to get us there? And that uh, is what is called parsing. So parsing is taking the string, figuring out what uh, productions of the grammar were used in what sequence uh, to get us from the start production, the start variable, all the way through to that particular given string. So in other words, parsing is taking a given string finding a derivation or derivation tree, which is just a visual representation of a derivation for that string. So we start with S and we need to find a derivation that starts with S. And then after zero or more applications of productions, we would actually have to have at least one. We eventually get to that string and that string is only going to be terminals. And since parsing finds the steps along the derivation, it can also be used to determine which and in what order the productions were applied. And that could be important uh, for some applications. Parsing should also report a failure if the string can't be reached, if it's not in the language. So in other words, if we give it a string that's not in the language, it should tell us, no, I can't get that. I cannot find a derivation for that. It might even give us useful information about why it couldn't find uh, a derivation for that. And one way to think about this uh, is think about you uh, errors as being where you've given a string that's partially right, but then there are rules that can't be, can be applied in part of it, but not in another part. It'd be nice to know, rather than just saying yes or no, say no, but here's where things went wrong. Everything was okay up to this point. And think about that like a compiler error when you write a program. There's an underlying grammar for the programming language, the parser for the programming language, or the compiler is applying the rules of that, trying to figure out what you meant and how you meant it. And if you have something that's syntactically incorrect, a missing parenthesis, missing semicolon, curly braces in the wrong place, uh, the wrong keyword used with the wrong syntax, it's useful to have the compiler say, your program didn't compile, and here's where it went wrong. There's something missing here. There's something expected here that wasn't there. Or you used an operator here in a way that it's not supposed to be used. So things like that uh, are useful in parsing as well. Okay, so one of the ways that I like to think about parsing is like solving a maze. In other words, we have 
the start production, the start variable. And then we have the string that we're that's being parsed, the string we're trying to find the derivation for. And then we have this maze of what productions to use and in what order to get us from here to there. And if you think about these variables uh, branching out, you can th really think of it like almost exactly like a maze. When S gets expanded, there might be more than one way to expand it. And if there is more than one way to expand it, that's like a you're going down a hallway and you have it diverging in different directions. Maybe it goes left and right. Maybe it goes left, right, forward. Maybe it branches five ways or ten ways or a hundred ways. It depends on the, the grammar. But that branching out, what we want need to do is figure out which one of those paths is the right one to take to lead us to this. And then uh, when we get to take that path, the next step of each of those paths might branch out, and those might branch out. So notice that parsing can be somewhat non-trivial. Uh, the idea of how do I know which path to take to get us there uh, can sometimes be tricky, but we're going to look at some techniques to help us with that here in a little bit. So there are a whole lot of methods for parsing, for solving that maze. Uh, some of them start from S and work their way toward the string. Some of them start with the string and work their way backwards toward S. Uh, this is called top down if you start with S. Bottom up is where you start with the string and work backwards. But it really is like finding a maze. We're trying to find the productions that were used in what order and how they were applied. Uh, what ways did we branch and what ways did we uh, travel down uh, the different steps of that derivation to get us from here to there. Now, uh, there are a lot of methods for parsing, like I said. Some work for any context-free grammar. Some only work for restricted uh, forms of context-free grammar. Uh, we're going to look at a few methods today, uh, some simple ones. And in the compiler design class next semester, uh, you should be looking at some more of those uh, and spending a lot more time with parsing. This, since this is an automata class, I wanted to touch on it, at least give you a motivation uh, for it to some extent. But next semester, you're going to see a lot of that in the compiler class. And parsing is probably the biggest topic in a compiler uh, class that's the least trivial of the steps of the uh, compiler. All right, anyway, uh, you'll see that next semester. Now, right now, the first method we're going to look at is called exhaustive search parsing. And what exhaustive search parsing is, uh, it, the idea of it is that we, and you'll see why it's called exhaustive here in a second, but basically we generate all strings in the language and see if the string that we're trying to parse for is one of them. So in other words, it's kind of like taking all paths through the maze. In other words, we come to a branch, what do we do? We take both paths. Those come to branches, what do we do? Take all of those paths. When those come to a branch, what do I do? Take all those paths. So it's exhaustive because it blows up very quickly into a lot of different uh, pathways that need to be investigated. And we basically keep doing that and expanding that and expanding that until we get to some uh, end of some hallway where our string alpha, the one we're parsing for, we find that. And then at that point, if we kept track of which route we took, which paths we took, we went left here, we went right there, we went straight here. Uh, if we took, kept track of that, all of the productions that were used along the way, we now have our derivation. Now, uh, exhaustive search parsing can be uh, problematic, though, and we'll see why in a second. So potential problems. Uh, first off, the language we may be parsing for could be infinite, and productions can recurse back and call, each other, call themselves in some way. And we need some kind of method that won't run forever, and we'll find a derivation if one exists, and we'll report a failure if one doesn't exist. And so the question is, if we have something that loops back and loops back and loops back, is there a good way to know that this won't run forever? And is there a good way to know that it'll eventually produce a result? And there's another problem, too, that some languages, just the level of branching will blow up so much that it would consume all of the memory that we have available to us. And even with an infinite size memory, it might take us a really long time. We would eventually find our string doing this, but we might need more memory than there are atoms in the universe, and we might need uh, more time than there is in the universe before it reaches heat death. So this is uh, can be useful for some kinds of things, but it can also have these problems associated with it. We're going to look at ways to mitigate those a little bit. But exhaustive search is, well, it's exhausting. 
because it uses so much resources and we're just expanding everything. We're going to look at ways to improve it here in just a little bit. Okay, so let's look at an example. So with exhaustive search parsing, here's a really simple grammar. Branch is three, has three productions for S, so only three. And the string A, B, A, A, B, B is a relatively short string, and we want to parse that for this grammar and say, hey, what productions could be used in what order to get me that string from this? So we start off with S, and in exhaustive search parsing, we branch it all three of those ways. So here, ASB, there's ASB, there's SS, there's SS, and here's Lambda down here. So we branched all three of those ways and tried them, and the first thing we might notice is, well, that Lambda production, that is a dead end. That, we reached the end of a hallway, the thing that we had, Lambda, does not match our strings, so let's just get rid of that, cross that off. But these two are still viable. Could be this, could be that. All right, so we start down this path here, and we expand that. So, uh, and we expand that. So notice the lambda didn't go anywhere, but these other two, this one expanded to, we took the S, and we replaced all three of the possibilities for that. So A, S, B, A, A, S, B. So that's A, S, B being plugged in for S. This is the S, S being plugged in for S. This is lambda being plugged in for S. And then we do the same thing with SS. Here's the first S being replaced with ASP, the second S with ASP, first S with SS, second S with SS, first S with Lambda, second S with Lambda. And now we look at those at that step and say, did we find our string yet? And in this case, there's some of these we can eliminate as well. So for example, this one here, this was an impossible one because it started with AA and it starts with AB. So we can get rid of that one. This one here, uh, A. Lambda B is just AB. That doesn't have enough terminals and it doesn't match our string, so we can get rid of that one. And then we can also get rid of this SSS uh, S, because it's a duplicate of that one. We already have that one on our list, so we don't have to add that one to the list twice. And we can get rid of S Lambda because S Lambda is just S and Lambda S is just S, so now this was, we're back to S again. Now, if we were a little bit wiser, we could also get rid of just S because we're already in S being expanded, so why loop back and then have all this stuff appear under it again? We could actually cross this one out too, but I'm going to leave it on there for now. So we can we can drop impossible sentences, and then we can expand each of the ones that remain. So to expand each of those ones that remain, now we're going to expand ASSB and ASSB. Here are all the ways that can expand. So ASB, ASB, in for the first S, second S. SS being inserted for the first S and second S, and then Lambda being inserted for the first one. And really, I we could have put the second one there as well, but since that's just going to be ASB again, uh, I'm going to just put one of them there just to save a little bit of space. And now we would expand the next one. So the next one, ASBS, here's uh, ASB plugged in for the first S, here it is for the second one, here's SS for the first one, SS for the second one, we'd have Lambda for the first one, so we'd get ABS, and we'd have lambda for the second one, which would be uh, ASB, and so on. And we would keep expanding all of these like that. Now, I don't have enough room on the slide to go through all of those and show all of those. So I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase and show how we got through this. This is going to explode, though, with just tons and tons of these sentential forms that we're keeping track of along here. But eventually, our string is going to appear as a sentence somewhere in this. And so the path taken to that sentence, uh, in other words, A did this, and then in, or did, let's say SS, and then it did this, and then that did this, and so forth. Whatever route we took to get to that sentence that has our string, that's going to be our derivation. So let's actually take a look at uh, the derivation for that. So here's what we would eventually find. We went to S produces ASB. And then we end up with uh, this stuff here. Now, this ASB, we, that's actually never going to lead to our string. So this is the first thing that we expanded over here, ASB. That's actually never going to lead to that. Even though we start with an A and end with a B, this can never lead there because the thing inside of here is never going to match. So this is going to blow up into a lot of possibilities here on this first line. They just never get anywhere. But the second one, S produces SS. I'm just going to follow the one path down the road it gets there. S goes to SS. The first S goes to ASB. The second S goes to, or that first S there goes to Lambda. 
The next one, now this S gets substituted with ASB. This uh, S now gets substituted with ASB, and that S gets substituted with lambda. And then since lambda is empty string, we get A, B, A, A, uh, B, B, which is what we were trying to parse up here. Now, note that, with, that to get us there, we have, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, six total steps uh, to get us to our string. And you'll note that with exhaustive search parsing, we can kind of prune as we go too. We can kind of make it a little more intelligent by saying, hey, if I have more terminals in my cent central form than are in my string, then I can just cut that branch off. It's never going to, there's no way to remove thing terminals back out of a string in a context-free grammar. So we could just cut any of them off. So if I get like, let's say, uh, 10 terminals and I should, it was looking for uh, nine, or in this case where I was looking for six, if I ever got to a thing that had seven terminals, I could just cut that branch off and say, this is never going to be useful. Another thing we can do is if I have a prefix of some sentential form uh, that doesn't match the prefix of our string, so kind of like we did that, actually did that back here, uh, right here with this AA, AA could not start our string. So the prefix of terminals of that could never match this because the first two symbols of this, A, B, don't match this. And so we can get rid of uh, anything where the prefix, uh, terminal prefix of this, the sentential form does not match the prefix of the same length of the string we're trying to parse. Uh, one other thing is it can actually be helpful to remove lambda productions and unit productions and obviously useless productions because we cut down on the amount of uh, branching. We also cut down on uh, things that are branching to eventually do nothing or things that are branching just to go to replace one variable with another variable. In other words, if I get rid of unit productions and lambda productions and useless productions, then every step along my, uh, as I branch, will add some sort of terminals, which gets us more quickly to our string or more quickly to one of these two things that allows us to prune that uh, pathway that we're going down. Okay, so let's look at some uh, example code. And this is some example code that I, I put together uh, for that, um, that little language that we had over here. So this, this context free grammar here. And you notice this is using Python, and I'm going to explain how this works. Uh, th it's actually, this shows kind of the power of Python, uh, that this little code, I don't know how many lines of code, this is 10 lines of code that actually does the work, maybe less, uh, of the actual exhaustive search parsing. This is the entire thing. We're not importing anything. We don't need anything. But let me explain how this works. So these are just print statements. It asks us to input a string. We type in the string we want to be parsed. We hit enter. Now what happens is I have this uh, dictionary or this list of tuples that I'm calling productions. We could use a dictionary here um, if we wanted to. I'm just going to use a list. So one of the things that you'll notice uh, that I'm doing here is I'm saying this is representing the first production, S produces ASB. And maybe I should have used a dictionary here, but we'll just go through it this way. And then the second one, S produces SS. And then S produces, this is lambda. Notice lambda, I'm not using a special symbol, I'm just using empty string, string of zero length, which is really what lambda is. And then I'm starting off my current list with just the start production S in it. Now the concept here is I'm going to take this uh, in my current list, and it says, okay, I have a variable in that. The first variable is S. So I'm going to add to my current list every one of the things that S could be replaced with. So I can basically go through and add ASB, I could add SS, and I could add nothing in place of that. Now I have this iteration variable that I set to zero, uh, and then I enter this loop. I say, while the string is not in our current list. In other words, how do I know when to stop? I will stop when I find the string. Now notice in this case, I don't have any other way for this to stop other than when I find the string. We don't have any error uh, checking or anything like that or any limit on the number of uh, iterations before it stops. I just say, when I find the string, I'll stop. Now, the idea here is it's a, I have a common expand current list into new list. So new list is empty. So I say my new list is going to be nothing. And then I'm going to say for every sentential form in the current list. So for, in other words, for everything that's in the current list, then go through the for loop. And since each of these uh, 
or go through a for loop for all of them in the list, and for every one of the productions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to replace the variable, so in other words, s, with whatever is on here. So for every one of these, s does this, s does that, s does that, and that's one of the reasons I didn't use a dictionary here. Um, if I used a dictionary, I'd have to have an have an s and then a list of things that it did, uh, which maybe would have made it a little more uh, complicated to understand. But basically, I'm just going through every production and say, hey, here's a production with s, and so take the sentential form I'm on, and if there's an S in there, replace it with, this should be right-hand side. I have uh, that listed as uh, LHS. Let me change that. That should be right-hand side. Make this better. Right-hand side. Right-hand side. Okay. So in other words, I'm replacing the variable, every variable, uh, or the first variable I encounter, Right hand side, and that's what that one means. That means just replace one of them, the first one you encounter. So replace the first variable with the right hand side, and then app goes into this new form. And then I say, hey, if the new form is not uh, in equal to the f sentential form that we're on now, and if the new form is not already in my new list, in other words, I don't add them twice. So if it's not the same as what I am, and it's not the same as something that's already in the new list, then add it to the list. And that's it. So in other words, once I have that, I've complete this loop, I will have gone through every one of the things in my current list, replacing the first variable with every possibility of things that matched up with it. And I'll put those in the new list. And then at the end of this, I just say, okay, now make the current list equal to the new one to replace the current one with the next generation. And then I print out some stuff and then I go around and I do that again. And I keep doing that until I find the string. And if once I do find the string, I print out parses found after iteration, iterations, and then I print out the final, uh, the length of the final list with how many sentential forms it had. Now, when I actually run this, and I feed that string in that we had earlier, a b a a b b, you might say, well, how many uh, sentential forms do I end up in that list towards the end, right before I find it? Here is it running. So the first iteration we get three, just like we did when we did it on paper. The second generation, I get six, uh, which is the those three kind of branching. And then the next generation, I get 13, and then 27, and 59, and then 128. And then I, oops, and then I finally find it amongst the 128 there. And it would have been um, a uh, derivation that we found for that string A, B, A, A, B, B. But notice that that list ballooned up after just six iterations to 120 items in it. And then we said, oh, I found it. Now, there are some uh, things that we can do to improve the performance of this. And the first thing is, is notice that we're not pruning anything right now. We're never checking those things. Are there more terminals? Uh, is the, does the prefix not match? So let's add a little bit of pruning into this. So here's the code with some pruning. Notice that this is the same basic concept we had before, except for one thing. I've added this function here, uh, oops, to called terminal prefix, which I pass in a string and it returns just the string of terminals at the beginning of that string that I pass in. And then I can check that against the terminal prefix of the thing that I'm on. So in other words, down here you can say term prefix equal terminal prefix of the new form. And I say, hey, if the length of the terminal prefix is less than or equal to the length of the input string, and if the terminal prefix uh, is equal to the beginning of the current string up to the terminal prefix, uh, in other words, the first n characters of this, do they match that? And if they... Uh, So the idea here is that if those match, then it's allowed to be added as a new form. If they don't match, then that's thrown out because we don't want it. It's not something that could ever lead to that. So we added just a few lines of code down here, and this function to add this pruning. And now let's see what happens when we run that. And notice that this is now uh, exhaustive search parser uh, with pruning, and it's still not very much code. It's still a very uh, small amount of code here. All right, so there it is. Before, remember, it ballooned up to 120, what was it, 128 sentential forms. Now we run this, and it goes up to only 27. So we've lost about 100 of these pathways 
uh, by just a little bit of simple pruning like that. It still takes us six iterations, but we used much less memory. Now there's one other thing that uh, we can do as well to make this a little bit better. And let's take a look at what that is. So one of the things that we could do is with exhaustive search parsing, we still have these problems. Lambda productions in a grammar can cause the length to kind of grow and then shrink back down again. So you'll notice that if we were to follow the sentential forms we were creating, we'd have S go up to SS and then to SSS, so we could get an arbitrary string of S's all together. But any of those S's could eventually be replaced by lambda and they could go away again. So we can end up with these cycles where we're doing hey, this goes to that and to that, and then it backtracks back down to this and back down to S and back down to Lambda. And so we'd be passing these things through a lot, growing things, having them go away again, growing them, having them go away. And really, um, that's one of the things that we can do. The other thing we can do is any production that doesn't generate a terminal can just keep expanding and we can't really prune that because the only way we can prune it is if I have more terminals than I have... Uh, symbols in my string that I'm parsing, or the terminal prefix doesn't match, uh, the terminal prefix of a sentential form does not match the beginning terminals of the string we're trying to parse. And if all I have are a bunch of variables like this, I can never match those up and I can never prune them. Um, so the idea here is that we want to, it can be helpful to eliminate all lambda productions uh, and remember, you can always eliminate all lambda productions unless uh, lambda is in the language. And if it is, then we need one, and it only needs to be at the very beginning of the grammar, the very beginning of start production, which is S produces lambda, or and then something else that is guaranteed not to have lambdas. So let's look at how we would eliminate that. Okay, so if we're going to remove the lambda productions in the grammar, uh, except for S in this case, because lambda is an element of our language, so there you can see S producing lambda. So what we do is we separate that out. Here's S producing lambda, or here's the rest of it that's guaranteed not to have lambda. Now we remove the lambda productions from the rest of this. So we get A produces AAB, A produces AA, and A produces AB. So this is what that would look like with lambda productions removed. So that keeps lambda in the overall languages, but it eliminates all the other ones. So what you'll notice down here is that we'll never have something grow and then shrink back again. It'll never grow an A and then replace it with a lambda. It's always going to just add more and more things each time. Now we do have this where we have AA there. We could actually uh, simplify this so this always starts with a variable or a terminal as well by substituting. Well, A could either do that or that or make three of these. So we can make a version of that that uh, doesn't have that. But we're going to leave that for right now and just try it with this. So to do that, we now have a different grammar. We just replace that. This is all the same. There's just one line that's different. S now produces A, or S produces lambda. A produces A, B. A produces A, A. A produces A, B. So now, rather than growing things and having them shrink back, the possibility of shrinking back, you're growing things that we cannot... Uh, know for certain whether they have the right number of symbols or not, or too many symbols. What we could do now with just changing the productions of that grammar, we now have a version, we run it again, we'll put in A, B, A, A, B, B. And you remember we went from 128 sentential forms in our final uh, iteration down to what, 27? Now let's see what we got. Now we're down to only uh, nine, and we actually found the parse after five iterations rather than six. And the final list only contained nine sentential forms. So much better. So if we think we started with 128, and now we're down to nine, we're doing much, much better. Many, it's also going to be faster because we're not expanding uh, as many things uh, relative to what we were doing earlier. And we're never creating things that are eventually going to disappear uh, because Lambda is going to replace them. The only place Lambda will ever exist is if we're at the very beginning of the um, thing. Now, this code is still not a, a good parser uh, for a couple reasons. One is that if we had a more complex language, this would still explode to very large numbers of things. A second reason that this isn't good 
is I don't have any way to make it stop now. It, it will run forever until it finds that. We should really have a way that if we expanded everything beyond the length of where it would get this string and there was nothing left in our current list, then we would want it to break and say, I didn't find it. It's also not reporting any kind of error. So if I have something wrong, this is never doing something saying, hey, I got to a point where I had a pretty good thing going here and then I couldn't go anywhere from there. There's no uh, easy way to do, at least in the code we have right now, some kind of error reporting. Also notice it's not really reporting the uh, uh, keeping track of the sentential form list, the derivation as it goes. It's just basically saying if it found one or not. But we, we could add that to the code uh, if we wanted to. Okay, so that's exhaustive search parsing. Still, we've made it much better by adding those uh, the pruning and then simplifying the grammar a little bit. But things can still blow up to an unreasonable number of sentential forms if we have a long string or we have a complicated uh, grammar that's less trivial than the one that we have in here. Okay, so how can we do a better job of this? And we're going to look at one other uh, parsing method uh, today. And the second parsing method that remember that parsing is like solving a maze that we're starting with S we're, when we come to a branch in the uh, maze, the branch in the uh, labyrinth or catacombs or whatever you want to think of it as we have to know which of these branches do I take? Which path do I take? And then when we come to the next branch. We have to say, well, which one of these should I take? And the idea here is what if we could write the grammar in a form that allows us to know which path to take at any given step. And so rather than just taking all of them, we get to a branch and we say, I think I have, for example, the letter A, I should go to the left here and not go to the right. And the idea here is if we could look at the next symbol in the string and use that to kind of have like a sign on the wall or a roadmap that says, oh, I have an A coming up. I haven't done anything with it yet but I know that's going to be an A next, and this branch has a B next, don't take that branch. Take the one that has A. And if we could ensure that we could always look at the next symbol and always know which production to use uh, in that next derivation, then it basically would become uh, a much more uh, simplified process because we're always only taking one branch at every step and we know which one to take. Now that requires uh, a language for which we can do that and a grammar written in such a way, you know, a form that is suitable to know, okay, the grammar tells me that the left is uh, substrings that start with A and the right is ones that start with B and going straight is ones that start with C. I have an A coming up, I'm going to go left. And so the idea there is we have to have the grammar in a form that allows that and the language itself has to be uh, of a subset of context-free languages that allows that. And in this case, uh, the method that we're going to look at is called recursive descent parsing. There are actually other methods uh, of doing this kind of parsing that are table-based um, that you'll probably see next semester in the compiler class. But let's start off with recursive descent parsing because it's a, a kind of parser that I think is easy to understand. Uh, it's easy to implement. And we'll look at why that is here in a second. But for this to work, for recursive descent parsing, uh, we need to have a grammar that's written in a special way. And it needs to be what's called an LL1 grammar. And LL1 is a, a grammar that's written such that the next step of any derivation can always be determined by looking at just one incoming or upcoming symbol on our input, the next symbol that's coming up on our input. And the LL uh, if, and the 1, what those stand for is LL is ladies love and 1, no, that's not right, that's cool Jay. Uh, I don't, you guys might be too young to understand LL cool, who LL cool Jay is, but uh, I guess he's an actor slash rapper, musician slash something else now, but, but anyway. Uh, LL, the first L, in an LL1 grammar, the, L, the first L stands for the fact that it's going to read the input from left to right. So kind of it's going to start with the first symbol and then it's going to go to the next one and the next one, the next one. So it's scanning the symbols from left to right on our input. 
The second L stands for producing a leftmost derivation. In other words, when it comes across a, a variable, it's going to always replace the leftmost one. It's always going to produce a leftmost derivation for our uh, parse for our string that we're after. And then the one stands for using one input symbol of look ahead at each step to make uh, that derivation parsing decision. In other words, to know which path to take, it looks at the input says, I see there's an A coming up. I'm going to take the path that leads to an A. And the grammar has to be written in such a way that we always know which path to take. Now, there are other classifications. There's uh, LL0, which means there are no choices in productions. That's not so useful because you can't have things that branch at all. It basically just devolves to like a linear uh, thing. And then there are also uh, other LL uh, grammars that are called LLK, which means there's a constant amount of look ahead symbols that you can keep track of. Maybe it's two, maybe it's five, but it's constant. It would never be infinite. Some constant could be a large number, but it's constant. But in, in each of these cases, reading input from left to right, producing a leftmost derivation, and how many symbols we look ahead. Now, an interesting uh, thing that we mentioned earlier, but I'm going to mention again, is a compiler uses a parser to find a derivation for your source code. So you'll learn more about these classifications uh, next semester, along with other par parsing methods uh, in the compiler class. But what I want to do is focus on that LL1 grammar and how we can write a recursive descent parser for that. You'll probably look at other parsing methods uh, next semester. Maybe you'll look at uh, SLR or GLR or LALR, uh, or maybe you'll look at um, early parsing, or there, there's a whole bunch of different parsers. You could actually have a whole, uh, you could probably have like a whole like four years worth of learning about different kinds of parsers. Um, but we're going to look at recursive descent parsing because it's pretty simple, it's easy to understand, and it's easy to implement. So let's look at an LL1 grammar first. Okay, so here's an example grammar. S produces ASA or BSB or DAD, and then A produces CA or C. So the first question is, is this LL1? Can we tell what path to take along each step along the way here? And in this case, uh, let's look at variable s. Variable s, if we look at that, can we tell which of these to take given an input symbol? They all start with something unique. That starts with a, that starts with b, that starts with D. So yes, the signpost we can put on the wall says if I see an A, take this branch. If I see a B, take this branch. If I see a D, take that branch. So it's kind of like we spray painted A and pointed an arrow toward this one, spray painted a B on the wall of the maze, the cave, pointing to that one, spray painted a D pointing to that one. So I can say I have an A coming up on my input. I know which branch to take, that one. Now, if you look at variable A, that's a little bit more confusing because both of these start with C. This is C followed by calling A again. And this is C with nothing after it. So what we could do is we could guarantee that if I have a look at the input and I see a C, then both of these do that. So we could kind of factor that and say I either just match that C and then I either call A again or I exit. I just exit without calling A again. So how do I know which one of those things to do? Do I either call A again to expand it again, or do I just terminate, exit that A, return from it? And in this case, the way we're going to determine that is if I see another C coming up, I go ahead and do that. And the reason that that works is because there can never be a C that follows this A variable anywhere else. So following the A when the A is done is always going to be a D. So if I see a C coming up, I know I need to call A again. So this was like always kind of consume the C and then look and if I see another C then consume that or call A again to consume that. If I don't see a C coming up, if I see a D coming up, then just exit from this because I know it has to be that D that follows it. 
And what you're going to end up doing in the compiler class is you're going to end up computing these two different sets. One is called first, which was what's the first symbol that appears in each of these. This, the first of this would be A, the first of that would be B, the first of that would be D. The first of S would be the set A, B, and D. And then there's a second part of this is called the follow. What can follow that particular thing? So what could follow S is A and B. What can follow A would be this D. And so by computing those first and follow sets, we can make sure that this is genuinely uh, LL1. And the idea there, as long as the parse table has no multiply defined entries, or in this case, as long as every branch, we can determine which way to go. So in this case, this is uh, LL1. So the concept for how do we make a recursive descent parser is pretty simple. We're going to make functions for each variable in the grammar. So if we think of S as being a function we call, it has three possible things it could do. It either does this, or it does that, or it does that. And we call function A, it has two possible things it can do. It can do this, or it can do that. And then we're going to use this kind of function called match that's going to consume a symbol and go to the next uh, thing. So we say, hey, match an A. So we expect an A. We have match of an A. It says everything's great. The symbol we were expecting match the one that we uh, thought should be there. Or the one we were expecting match the one that was there. So we go to the next symbol. So match just kind of moves us through the string one at a time and consumes the symbol as it does so. All right, let's look at some code. Now, I realize this is kind of small the way it's written on there. Um, but uh, the idea here is pretty simple. Let's start with S. So S, this is going to match. I shouldn't use the word match. This is going to essentially an analog to our production. S produces ASA or BSB or DAD. So here's a variable S has a function S. And what it does is says, hey, if the string at the index we're on is an A, then here's the body of the production. Match an A, call S, match an A. And what does B look like? Well, if I see B, then I match B, call S, match B. If I see a D, then I match. Um, and notice that that's in an else, not an else if, because if it wasn't an A and it wasn't a B, the only other choice was it was a D. So we try to match D, call A, match D. Now, here's the function for A. What does A look like? Well, we always match a C, no matter what. And then we say, hey, if the next thing coming up is another C, then call A again. So we go ahead and call it again. And otherwise, this will just return. Now, you'll notice that the, oops, whoa, that got out of control. You'll notice that the one other thing that I'm doing here is in my code down here, when I read in the input string, I'm adding this null character on the end. And that is because I don't want it to say it's a good parse if there's extra junk on the input after the program was done. So I add a null on the end, and then I call s, and s should consume all the symbols that are there, except for the null we added on the end, because null wasn't part of this, uh, these functions anywhere. And then after that null at the end, we match the null. And if everything matches correctly, then the parse uh, is considered correct. Now notice in the match function what it does is it basically says, if the string, if the character I passed in matches what's in the string right now, then we just move the index ahead one position. We matched it. Everything was good. We moved on. If it didn't match, then I print out an error saying, hey, there's an unexpected character that I expected to see this, and I got that instead. And then I increment my error count. So in other words, if I get all the way down here where this is completed and I have no errors, I found a derivation for, for that uh, string that was put in. All right, so let's look at a run of it. Here's a run uh, putting this in, and this does match the language. You'll notice say it says parse completed, zero errors. And let's just quickly walk through this. So when we call this the first time, my index is on zero. It's right there. So which part of the function is it going to take? It's going to call match A, call S, match A. So this A is the, has already been matched. And now we call S. But since that's been matched, the index moved ahead to here to this B. And now we called S again. So now the second time into this, we say, oh, there's a B. Let's match B. 
So we match that one and moved ahead, and then we call s, and then that is going to uh, then hit uh, that function s again with an a as the first thing. So it says, hey, there's an a, so match a, call s again. Now we have d. So now that we have d, we've just called s, that's going to hit the else down there, which matches the d, which moves us ahead to there, calls a. Now that we're in a, we match c, which moves us ahead one. It says, oh, there's a c coming up, call a again. That A again matches that C, and now we say there's not a uh, C coming up. So we skip that and we return uh, from that. And then we return from the first A that we were in, and now we are back uh, to the uh, place where we called uh, match D, call A, match D. We match the second D, we return from that, we match the A from the uh, previous call to S, we match the B from the previous call to S, we match A to the call from S, and now we're at the end. We're at the null. We have returned all the way from S, we match the null, and we made it all the way through the whole string with zero errors. Now if we wanted to, we could add some print statements in here that would print out, hey, I took S produces A, S, B, and then I the next thing is this, and the next thing is that, and the, so we could actually see what productions were used in what order. All right. Pretty cool. Now, the and note and notice that it's easy to tell what this is doing because we just look at the function. We can we could reconstruct the grammar by looking at the code. S okay. S is a variable. It has three possibilities: a s a, b s b, d a d. Just like we have up here. C has match C, and then either call this again or don't call it again. So that's what we have up here. All right, now let's do one where it fails. So A, B, C, D, B, or A, D, C, D, B, yeah. Okay, so this one actually is not in the language, and you'll notice that this is going to tell us that, and notice it hits that air condition. So let's start off uh, with the first one, A. We match the A, call S. We hit D. D is now, we're in S again. D is going to match D, which is going to move on to the C, and then call A. We call A, it matches that C, and it says, oh, the next character is not a C anymore, so we exit from A, and now we're back to where we called that from where we matched the first D, so D, A, we're on the second D of that, we match that, and now we hit that B, but the place we hit that B is where we had just, uh, in this part where we did A, S, A, we're expecting a B, uh, and we got an A. So it prints on error, unexpected character B, when A was expected at index 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, we're on that B. It says, hey, I thought there should be an A there. There wasn't, there was a B. So that prints out that error, increases the error count by 1, and then it returns. And now we're back out of S, and we try to match the null. And we say, oh, hey, I found a character B when I expected a null at position 4. And then that's the end of this match down here, parse completed, and we had two errors. One for where we were expecting a B, one for where we were expecting a null, and we saw the B, or an A, when we, we found a B when we expected an A, we expected a null when we had a B. All right, so this actually is useful because it produces errors as it goes. Now, you can actually write an entire compiler using this, uh, Kind of recursive descent parser. In fact, uh, the Python language itself, the language spec for Python, was designed such that it could be represented with an LL1 grammar. So you could actually write an entire Python interpreter using this kind of uh, recursive descent parser for it. And that's pretty cool. Now, let's look at uh, one other example here, but before we do that, I want to uh, mention a couple things about uh, LL1 grammar. So the first thing is that a language is called an LL1 language if it can be generated uh, by, in, in other words, if you can write an LL1 grammar, you know the language is LL1. And LL1 grammars have these properties associated with them, that they are not ambiguous, in other words, each step of a derivation has to be uniquely identifiable by that next input symbol that's coming up. That means there's no room for ambiguity in that. The second part about an LL1 grammar is it cannot have left recursion. 
In other words, you can't have productions in a form that are in the form A produces. So a variable produces variable as the first thing on the right hand side. Uh, next thing is not all languages are LL1. So there are context free languages that are not, but some are some you can put them into an LL1 format. Uh, even if you don't have an LL1 gram originally and those that are LL1 can be parsed with a recursive descent parser. So in other words, if you can make an, an LL1 grammar, you know you have an LL1 language, and then you could write a uh, recursive descent parser kind of like this for that. Now, there are many other types of parser, and like I said, you're going to study probably study several of those next semester. Now let's do one final example of this uh, to give you uh, a little bit of a motivation here. So here's a useful grammar. That other one with A's and B's and C's and D's, it just seems like this abstract thing. But here's one that's actually useful. And you might first look at this and think, well, what, what is this? This doesn't look useful. It's got like S produces E, E produces eat or T, uh, T produces TMF or F, uh, F produces E in parentheses. So I have put in kind of this blue color, this blue gray color, all of the terminals. So the terminals are left parenthesis, right parenthesis, zero digit zero through nine, plus minus uh, times divided by mod. Now what those variables stand for here, I've kind of given a little key over on the side there that E is an expression, S is just the start production. We could have just had uh, defined S as that, but S goes to E, E is an expression. So this is a, all of the things in our language are just expressions at the top. So an expression is an expression, an additive operator, and a term, or just a term. So in other words, if I have addition and subtraction things, then I can make, notice I can make an expression is another expression, and it's another expression. So this is going to can generate a thing of th list of things separated by pluses and minuses. Or if we don't have a plus or a minus, or we're done with pluses and minuses, I could just go strike directly on the term. And what a term is, a term and a factor separated by a multiplicative operator and a string of those, which could eventually end with just a factor. And what's a factor? A factor is either an expression in parentheses, which goes back to the top to fill in more things with pluses and minuses, or it's a number. And what's a number? A number is a digit followed by another number, or it's just a digit, so we get strings of zeros, uh, zero through nine here built up. And then what are the additive operators? Just plus and minus. What are the multiplicative operators that go in here? Times, divide, and then mod. So this is actually a grammar for arithmetic expression that only handles integers right now, but we could easily extend this so it handles hex constants and floating point numbers and things like that. But this is going to handle all arithmetic expressions. And it's actually even a little bit cooler than that in that uh, not only does it handle arithmetic expressions like this, but it's also encoding the order of operations. Notice that at the top level, we have things separated by addition and subtraction. And then at one level below that, we have things separated by multiplication and division. And one level below that are things in parentheses, which can go back up and have more things that are in parentheses or have that. Or if I have a digit, a number, then I just chain together the digits there. So this is actually a really cool, uh, useful grammar in that it encodes the order of operations correctly so that the multiplication and division and the things in parentheses are going to happen lower in the parse. Those are going to happen first. And then toward the end, we're going to take the results of those and add and subtract them. So if we wanted to make a calculator that supported, or a programming language that supported order of operations correctly, this would be uh, a grammar that allows that to happen. Okay, now one thing about this though, let's look at this one last time. Notice that this is not, uh, this has left recursion in it. E, there's a production there that starts with E. T, there's one that starts with T. We've got to get rid of that. It's not LL1 yet. So to get rid of that, here we are with E now is T E prime or T. E prime is an additive operator. Another T and another E prime, which adds, allows us to add uh, plus minus term, plus minus term, plus minus term. Eventually, we're just going to end with an additive operator with a term. And then we do the same thing on the uh, term variable. It's either just a factor or a factor followed by a multiplicative operator with another factor. And we get to chain as many of those together and eventually that. So this is 
I got rid of the left recursion just using the technique that we talked about a couple classes ago. I told you it was useful to get rid of. And now you'll notice that we have something that's uh, maybe it's not immediately noticeable that this is uh, LL1. But you'll notice that in each of these cases, like let's focus on E for a second. We're going to call E no, or T no matter what. And then we need to decide whether to do E prime or not. Well, how do I know to do E prime or not? Well, E prime always starts with A. So the first of E prime is always going to be a plus or a minus. So if I see a plus or a minus coming up, then I would call uh, E prime. And then I would then match uh, or call A, call T. And then after I get back from that, I say, is there another addition and subtraction operator coming up? If there is, call E prime again. So this is going to chain together a whole string of those for us. Same thing with factors, but with multiplicative operators. Now, you could write uh, your recursive descent parser from this. And that will act as an expression parser that will preserve order of operations correctly. And now what would we do? We would take our string, just call S to parse this. And I'm not going to go through all of the, the code for this, but you're going to end up with a function for each one of these. There's some simplifications we could do on this. But since there's one kind of like that in the homework, uh, rather than doing all that for you, I'm going to let you do that. So you should look at the homework assignment. And there's one in there that's actually simpler than this, uh, but that it does kind of that recursive descent uh, it asks you to write a recursive descent parser for that a language. It's a very simplified version of what we have here. But if you were to implement this, you could actually write a full-blown um, expression, algebra, arithmetic expression validator. Or you could even have it so it computes the values and uses the order of operations. And so if you were to write your own programming language, you could write a recursive descent part of that that is handles all expressions and produces a value by computing all the things in the right order. We could add variables to this. We could add other operators, uh, exponentiation, whatever you want. And this is actually a really useful thing to, to study. And I'm sure you'll see something like this in the compiler class uh, later. OK, so that's it for today. Uh, go ahead and, and, wor and work on uh, assignment five. Also, there's a quiz uh, that's posted today, so make sure to look out for that. Uh, and assignment five is posted today as well. So look at both of those and everybody stay safe. Uh, and next class, uh, we are going to have um, a bonus lab. So if you've missed some point, there's going to be a little bit more work with some quizzes and some other stuff and lectures. Uh, but what my plan is uh, for this semester is to try to get through everything we can and have our paper final exam uh, before the, you leave for Thanksgiving break. So I'm going to get through a few more topics here. We'll have our paper exam before you leave for Thanksgiving break. And then after Thanksgiving break, there's a couple other topics I just want to post lectures for. Uh, so you're exposed to those. Um, and there will be an entire bonus lab. So if you've missed some points on quizzes here and there, uh, or didn't do as well in the midterm as you wanted to, uh, you could take that uh, or do that bonus assignment. And the bonus assignment is actually going to be something um, hopefully that's kind of fun. Uh, it's going to be programming related. And also keep in mind that there are still bonus points for the black box uh, automata. So all you have to do is start asking me some strings. And I promise you that it's not something outlandish or crazy. It's something you should be able to figure out. It's something I wrote a program for. So if you give me a few strings, I can give you answers back. And now that but those bonus points have now moved from the midterm to the final exam. And the final exam being worth more of a percentage than the midterm. The bonus points have now escalated in value. So you might want to ask me some black box uh, things and see if you can figure that out. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, ask me if you have any questions. Make sure to check and do the uh, quiz. Make sure you check on start on that assignment five. And assignment five is a programming assignment uh, that you're going to go through. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks. Stay safe. I'll stop now. One more thing. Just kidding.